Ye or El Diablo, aka Yester, has had one of the worst years as a Valorant pro from winning a Masters with the Optic Core to finding no luck in Tier 2. This is the tragic downfall of Valorant's best player. What makes someone the best player? Is it mastering multiple agents at a high level or consistently outperforming the level of play at each year? Or is it just winning multiple trophies back to back? Well as of now, we can bring a few of these players into the spotlight, but this wasn't the case a few years back. In 2021, we saw the first official masters event in which Sen had a flawless run and even a flawless player and it's because of this run and the hype around Sen that Tens would cement himself as the face of Valorant. With a strong core around him and a large fan base, things would initially go extremely well for them but that was until the North American Challengers playoffs for Masters Berlin. You see Envy was one of the 8 teams that had made it into the playoffs and before the tournament commenced they brought in Ye in place for Mummy as Ye previously played both on Sage and Jet. So Envy believed that Ye was a good replacement for Mummy as he perfectly fit into his shoes. But now the question was, how well could they ideally cook up strats in such a short amount of time? The first ever playoff match for Ye was with the team that knocked Anbox out which was literally the last game he played with them before hopping onto Envy. TSM was that team and if you know TSM, you'd know how big of a force they were in early Valorant, dominating that era until, well, they gradually fell off. But Ye would get to have his revenge and surprise Surprisingly, in that process, this Envy roster would find their superstar deal list. Envy Ye would shut down TSM and as his first game in Envy, he would hold up to that MVP status. But something was different and I'm sure FNS, the IGL of the team, saw this in Ye. He was extremely confident. The task for FNS now was to channel this confidence of Ye into something that the team could use to beat the best of the best out there. And the time to test that eventually came forward as their next game was with Sentinels the face of Valorant Esports. The match began and all expectations were met. Envy were able to actually compete with Sen, pushing onto double digits for each map they played. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be enough to stop Sick and Tens who had a really good game that day. And this result would bring Envy into the lower bracket wherein they'd have to face FaZe Clan, Exit, and 100 Thieves. Now with FaZe Clan, Envy were beaten on their map pick of Haven, but eventually came Bind and Ascent in which they looked pretty comfortable on. And Ye would really show up on Ascent as a jet main. This of course would lead them to their match with Exit. At the time Exit was one of the only teams to beat Sen and this was a pretty insane achievement. But this also went to show how promising the players in Exit were. BCJ, Def, Aaron, Zekin and Purer. Ye had a huge task ahead of himself and he had to prove what his true value was. Exit would pick Ascent and as the round started going by they looked pretty dominating on attack. And we know that this is a defensive side of map so if Envy didn't grab as many rounds as they could, they would be screwed on attack. But something special happened during the 8th round with Ye against Exet. Okay, the Cosmic Divide is actually what's gonna play contact. You see the smoke come out and the gravity well! BCJ was a sitting well. duck, he gets cleaned up by Ye. And Ye gets a second one as well! 34 health, he's got the hop. Dancing around oh! the corner, he gets 3! El Diablo, baby! You gotta fear him! Oh! Look at for this iconic round would clearly define Ye's role within the roster, but this wouldn't be the only one. Even on round 12 on Haven, Ye would clutch the round against Zekin and Purer, giving Envy that advantage to the next half. But even as Envy would eventually win this match, it was at the end of the day a team effort. Marv having an insane impact as an Astra, Victor and Crashies being the duo who always found themselves doing the impossible, and FNS guiding the whole roster including Ye. Soon came the lower finals, in which they had to face the 100 Thieves roster. Apart from Sen, these guys were the other NA giant. 100 Thieves apart from Asuna were a very well experienced roster, so beating them surely sets a new standard for the Envy roster. As the match went along, Ye was not disappointing, and as the close best of 5 ended, not only would Ye diff Asuna, but he was clearly more prepared to face 100 Thieves compared to Crashies and Victor who really struggled in that series. Regardless, Envy would make it into Masters Berlin, as the slots were open to the top 3 teams from NA. Envy knew this, and so did Ye. It was a rare opportunity for both of them, and thus they had to make a name for themselves. Masters Berlin began, and the stakes were on, as Ye was set to take down the two South American teams, which did give a good fight against Envy. Heat from Weavocade gave a tough time for Envy, but eventually they made it through to play Crew next. And at this point, the team was used to the land stage, and this was the case especially for Ye, as Envy would make Crew look like a ranked team. Ye's confidence on this team as a jet only 
only grew, and this allowed him to make ridiculous plays from time to time, which gave Envy an easy advantage. With Ye and his team now qualified for playoffs, it was time. As playoffs began, it was NA's best team versus Team Envy. FNS knew he had to change up from their last close encounter, so they picked Haven and were ready to face off Sen. As the first half went by, we could see how Ye was able to take up space as a jet and how his team was able to set him up to entry sites and even push up B main with the op to cut off that site. This worked on attack, but they seemed to choke quite a bit of rounds on defense as Sen were getting their game up. Eventually, the match would end on overtime with a convincing win by Envy. The second map of split was where Ye would truly shine. He would start off the game with a 1v2 clutch and on the round of 19 wherein he gives Envy a match point after getting a 3k against Sen. But once again, this wasn't just Ye and friends. Instead, the entire roster showed up. Ye wouldn't get the best value with the op on defense, but surely he wasn't struggling at the same time. His value on jet was seen on attack wherein he would aggressively push on his side and take on the Sen members when they simply aren't prepared. But his value as a jet would push even further than that as their next game was with the 100 Thieves who just beat a Sen. Envy had just lost the lower finals to 100 Thieves and now they had to face them in a best of three at Masters Berlin. Soon the time comes and after a few rounds we can see how Ye is really benefiting from this NB core. Being set up by crashies to clear C site and pushing onto spawn from B gives Ye those easy picks and his job as a jet is completely done. But what happens when he doesn't have his teammates around to set him up? Well once again during round 11 of Haven, Ye is placed in a 1v2 situation against Ethan and Steel. We can clearly see that this guy is more than ready to raw peak with an op against Hiko and even with a phantom against Steel with only 57 HP. Ye despite recently switching teams has no problem in doing what he did for Anbox on Envy. This confidence is what led Envy to a 2-0 victory against 100 Thieves and Ye had an insane ACS of 367 in that game which truly showed his impact in that series. But now the question was, could they beat Gambit? This is unfortunately where Ye's peak would be in 2021. But even though the rest of Envy would crumble onto Gambit's playstyle, Ye would be the only one who was actually shooting back. At times it felt as though nothing could stop him except his own team. But in the end of the day, Gambit were the better team and Ye and his team had to look for champs. But before we get into that, a quick word from this video's sponsor. World Anvil is the ultimate RPG campaign manager. It's got interactive maps, tools that help you build an original setting for D&D, Pathfinder, and over 45 RPGs. You can keep essential lore and stats, one quick click away for fast, hassle-free prep, and immersive sessions. It's got interactive maps, family trees, timelines, and automatic linking. So create a rich, engaging world for your game, novel, or series. World Anvil is an incredible suit of creative tools for the game masters, players, fantasy, sci-fi authors, and even multimedia storytellers. Not only that, but it's got novel planners, and writing softwares with drag and drop scenes and chapters, as well as publishing, subscription, and monetization features. You can get 51% off of any premium subscription with my code BUSTYVAL, and you can even click the link in the description. So what are you waiting for? Join World Anvil with over 2 million game masters using World Anvil for their campaigns. It was only a few months later, and Envy were seen in the Champions 2021 group stages. Ye would as usual consistently deliver, and as their victory over X10 was celebrated, little did they know that the next team that they would face was gonna win it all. Ascent was a pretty hyped up roster as we saw them competing in the Red Bull home grounds right before this champions and they did well enough to make it into the grand final against Team Liquid. CNET, Ascent's duelist player, had a very similar playstyle to Ye. He's always abusing the op and plays extremely well with his team. Plus, his individual plays really had people talking about him competing with Envy's Jet Superstar. The match began and while both Ye and CNET did perform, Victor didn't really have the best game as a Sky, and this really dragged the team down, but people were speculating that Chet, the coach, was the reason for Envy not playing like they did in Masters Berlin. But these excuses couldn't be used in the lower bracket when they had to face X10 again. X10, taking advantage of Envy's big loss, literally ran it down on them, not giving Envy enough time to set back and restructure how they wanted to approach this game. Subsequently, Ye would be diffed by Patty Pan, and Envy in general were not 
looking good and we were out of champions but in map 3 we could see how the team's mental is or rather Ye's mental. Normally he would never crouch spray but in a matter of desperation and pressure from the opponents we can see him crouch spraying often to get those kills which is simply not the way he really plays. Anyway I wanted to bring this up now because it does happen later as well. Soon Ye would play in a new team. Well it's basically the same team but now they had rebranded to Optic. At the same time a new agent had come into play called Chamber. This agent was classified as a sentinel even though it allowed players to take fights that a Jet or a Reyna would usually take on. Did he have a dash? Nope. A dismiss? Nope. This agent had a rendezvous or his personal little TP which allowed players to make ridiculous plays. Not only that but this agent had a headhunter which was basically a sheriff with only 8 bullets and even an ultimate which at the time was faster and more efficient than the op. This agent was built in such a way that players would abuse it. So why did I bring chamber up? Because that's exactly what 2022 Valorant would be known for. Ye's chamber. With the total force in hand. Ooh, as I say that, what is oh this? Yay! Get the Yay! 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 At the start, Optic would still make Ye play as a Jet from time to time, but something what they realized was that Ye felt pretty much comfortable playing on Chamber, and Victor was more than happy to rush in a site as a duelist. With this realization, Optic almost always put Ye on Chamber, and this worked because they would go on to beat Sen, C9, and even the Guard. Ye's stat at the time were absolutely insane. The agent looked like it was made for just this player. It felt as though Ye would finally be able to get his first big major with his Optic core. The agent Neon allowed Victor to entry site and thus Ye didn't always have to play as a jet. Victor was able to make good space and Ye was able to hold the line down post plan. With this strategy, Optic would have many maps to themselves like Fracture and Haven. This allowed them to easily qualify for Masters Reykjavik and have a smooth sail into the playoffs. Finally, Ye had mastered Chamber and I personally believe that this tournament was his peak. While the guard and even DRX did push Optic, Ye and his team were simply too ahead of the meta and while they would lose to loud in the upper finals the match was close and unless optic choked to zeta there was no way that this team could have lost zeta division had an insane lower bracket run and this run of theirs would be the best run any japanese valorant team has ever made till date this is what optic had to face but luckily for them marved would really turn up that game giving them the upper edge and a ticket to the grand finals Ye and his team found himself in another grand final the question was did they choke like they did to Gambit or was it different this time? The answer was simple. With Optic's newfound confidence, this led to Ye and his team's success. Especially on Bind, which was their second map, Ye would have one of the best performance in a grand final. His chamber really gave Optic an edge over this tournament, but we did see him play a good amount of Jet as well. Ye had finally won his first major in Reykjavik. This was truly his peak and no one could take it away from him but himself. As the rest of 2022 went by, we saw him only play chamber, who was officially the meta and the other North American teams did try to copy Optic's success with the agent but none to the level of how Ye used him. As the rest of 2022 went by we saw him only play chamber. It was officially the meta and as Masters Copenhagen came around it was clear that if Ye was having a bad game it would affect the entire Optic roster and we saw this against their game with Guild wherein Ye would very much struggle against the Guild core and as a result Guild would beat Optic with a 2-0 scoreline. Ye's value as a chamber against guilt just wasn't there. Instead we saw safe stealing Ye's spotlight and dominating that series. Optic would once again play against Exit, DRX and for the first time ever Paper Rex. After Optic's head to head with Paper Rex they would both tie up on map wins and this led to their deciding map of Fracture. And as the match went on it looked like this time Ye was the only one to show up and the rest of Optic were just not as prepared as him. Nobody expected Optic to perform so horribly against Paper Rex especially after beating DRX and even XZ. So what went wrong? The answer to that is when they were brought into the lower finals against FPX, an EMEA team. Remember on how we talked about in a map like Fracture, Ye plays the chamber and Vic enters site with his Neon and this was essentially the NA meta for a while because while Fracture was a new map and teams were yet to adapt to it, well Optic would pick this map for a while and would even beat Loud on it in the same tournament. But when they picked Fracture against DRX, they understood their mistake. In fact, DRX 
DRX humiliated them on their own map pick. It wasn't just DRX, cause in their next match, Paper Rex would do the same. And in both of these games of Fracture, Optic would be at the mercy of Ye, because well, whatever strats they had with Wix, Neon, simply did not work. This was their same case with their game with FPX. Because even though Ye would come out positive, it didn't really matter. Because yes, Ye can get frags, but these kills mean nothing if the rest of Optic don't adapt as well. And the other thing to consider is that there's a lot of footage of them on that map and the other teams were simply getting used to the neon stuff. Fortunately, Ye would have the good ending with Optic. While they never won VCT champions, they were in fact the best team that year. Ye and his team would make it into the grand finals of champions, wherein they'd play a best of five against Loud. At this point, there were two groups of people, one who loved the rivalry between Optic and Loud and the other who wished for a different matchup in the grand finals. Regardless of what they thought of, Optic and Loud after this grand final were tied up in their head to heads against each other. And this just goes to show you how these two teams really defined VCT in 2022, not to take away FPX win. But along with such an incredible year, Ye has cemented himself as that chamber guy. With Optic now losing to Loud, Ye was still very much present when it mattered. And despite the loss, he would go on to win the best esports athlete of the year, beating stars such as Simple and Faker. Last year, Ye was a nobody. And now this guy was competing against Simple and Faker? That's crazy. But all it really goes to show was how high of a peak this was for him. But everything that set him up for success would soon cause his downfall. In the end of 2022, the VCT scene would have some really big changes. And one of these changes was introducing Valorant franchising. Now in a nutshell, Riot's franchising or partnered teams is a way of drawing an artificial line between those partnered teams and those teams which aren't partnered. These partnered teams would go on to compete in their tier 1 tournaments. And well, they don't really have to fear competing in open circuits with random orgs. This is essentially a safe and secure spot for them. Now, with that being said, it's not very easy for a team to become franchised. And even with Optic's huge success in Valorant, Riot had to assess a lot of other things, which didn't really go according to their line of vision. And as a result, Optic wasn't accepted into their partnership program. We didn't deserve, there were fuck ups on the first two steps of that application on our side. So we didn't deserve to be in there. So after failing to secure a coveted NA Valorant franchise spot for the 2023 season, Optic Gaming was forced to let go of possibly one of the most talented Valorant rosters in recent history. The players knew their worth, and now that they were available, teams were looking to get them in their roster. FNS, Crashies, Victor, and Chet would join NRG. Marved would take a break from competitive Valorant, and this just leaves us with Ye. Ye at the time was probably the most valuable player, but that was just another problem you see. He was so high in stocks that nobody could really afford him. Not just because they couldn't pay him, but they just never saw him worth his value. There were plenty of other players who might have not won as much as Ye, but they did cost incredibly less. And so this was a problem which nobody could honestly control. But soon, a North American ARG would decide to take him in, introducing C9 Ye. This was a huge announcement, and people were excited to see how El Diablo would perform on a completely new roster. And soon came the Red Bull Homeground event, which was an off-season tournament for the new squad, and it was also Ye's first game for the team. Nobody was sure as to what C9 were cooking with Ye. Watching him play as a Yoru and the team's overall performance was just disappointing. But this was an off-season tournament, right? Why would it really matter? Because in the next few games of the tournament, Cloud9 would find success and Ye would have a decent showing, but they weren't really put to test until they faced 100 Thieves in the Grand Finals. 100 Thieves just like C9 would acquire a new player, Cryocells. And this guy was a mirror image of Ye, except that he fit in way better than Ye did with Cloud9. The match was a clean sweep and not only were the C9 fans disappointed, but they were worried and eventually they would be right. Soon came Riot's first big event for the franchise teams. It was called Lock in Sao Paulo. This was a single elimination tournament and had all the partner teams invited. It was an excellent opportunity for Ye and C9 to show what they had really prepared for the season. The roster consisted of Leaf, Zeppa, Vanity, Celsus, and Ye. And their first game was nothing but a banger matchup as they'd have to face Pacific's finest, Paper Rex. And as the match went on, it was clear that Paper Rex was certainly not prepared to face off C9. They simply looked disjointed and at the time lost, which would end them up in Zeppa's crosshair. It was a great showing for Cloud9 and Ye had a pretty good game as well. He would play as a sage on the map Pearl and it simply worked for the team. Things were looking great and well this hurts to say, but this would be the last time things ever looked good for Ye because Cloud9's next match was up against DRX and this was a really sad watch. 
match. C9 would initially bring out their Pearl, which worked well against Paper Rex, and it worked because even DRX could barely scramble a few maps against them. But the problem began after that. The next two maps would be nothing but a disaster to Cloud9, and even though Ye would play well on both Chamber and Jet, C9 were simply unable to set him up unlike Optic, and as a result, DRX exposed C9. The problem with C9 was that they could only really play one or two maps well with this comp, and this was now very clear. To what felt like a good start with C9 was only an illusion for Ye, as he would have the worst come for him. On the 2nd of March 2023, Ye would officially be dropped from C9, and they would release an official statement in a form of a video in which they'd go on to elaborate on why they made this strange decision to drop Ye. The reality is, considering the players that are on this team and the cost of this roster, we all had very high expectations of how we would do, and we weren't meeting those expectations. And because these role issues weren't getting cleared up, after working on this for some time, we decided it's probably best to mutually part ways, I'll let Ye figure out you know, what is the best team for him to be on while we sort out these issues uh, without him. Instead of telling us the real reason why, they blamed it on role issues. We too had watched their games, and we knew that this was simply not the case. Even if Ye had role issues, why would they drop him so early onto the season? Well, remember how I said not every team could afford him? This all goes back to that. C9 couldn't afford to keep Ye within the roster, and well, that's why they had to drop him out of the roster. I really wonder if things would have been different if C9 actually won their game against TRX. But from what I've heard, C9 had lost a major sponsor which resulted in this decision, but we really don't know. This was a huge news and of course, the Valorant community was taken aback by this. Yeah. With, the, with the current economic crisis and situation going on in eSports, I think Ye was costing too much. The whole issue were definitely the reason for me departing and the team coach definitely agreed with me being removed. Wait, why is there a lot of definitely's there? I th I Wait, that's th so sarcastic. Yeah, now, with all of the other rosters finalized, Ye didn't really have a chance to hop onto another franchise team, so Tier 1 wasn't really an option for him anymore. But there was an option of Tier 2. You see, Ye wasn't the only one kicked out by their arc and looking to play in Tier 2. Big names like Shazam and Dapper were in G2, and other teams like TSM were present in the Tier 2 scene. And the best part about Tier 2 was that you had teams funded by and set up by huge influencers like Mon moguls who actually performed pretty well. So if a big influencer exists and if the best Valorant player from 2022 was a free agent, things were definitely gonna happen. And so it did. On the 11th of April, DSG or Disguised would acquire Ye into their roster. Well who was DSG owned by? Toast. And this guy was ready to take all the risk and experiment on this team. It was certainly a ridiculous project and Toast knew this, but Ye would bring a lot of eyes into tier 2 games and this was a good thing for Toast. Ye brought in viewership and this viewership was destined to increase if they were to perform, but everything would crumble and fall apart. Take your pants down. It's okay, it's okay. You don't have to. What? Toast? Toast is just money. We can get the money back. I promise you. Right. No. Okay. I guess I'll see you guys in three weeks then. DSG would go on to lose every single match with Ye, and nope, not once did it ever seem like there was hope for this roster. But why? What went wrong? There were actually quite a few reasons, but as of lately, it's really clear as to what the real issue was. At the time, people said DSG looked so disjointed and so lost at times. And well, they were right, but they were simply judging DSG's performance within the game. And well, this is not something you can hide. What you can hide is hate, jealousy, and ego issues, which were very evident after a few incidents. All in all, Ye did his job. He performed as a jet. Yes, he wasn't as impactful as before, but that's not the point. A single player cannot change a broken roster, because even before Ye joined this team, they were losing to M80 and even TSM. Let's look at what really happened in DSG. On April 2024, one of the DSG members, Gangsta, would upload one of DSG's scrims, which was obviously not meant for the public to be seen. Relax, okay, you can yeah. fucking laugh all you want, bro, but it's so tilting when you make the same fucking mistakes and matches. The day this video was put out on Twitter was the same day that Ye and Bleed would lose horribly to Paper Rex towards the end of the season. This was a clear attempt at taking shots at a former teammate when they were at their lowest. Gangsta would then go on to say that Ye tried to bribe the coach with 10 grand to get him off the team. These were some serious accusations, and a lot of people within the community, like Governor and FNS, had things to say about this. Because because that stays within the team. There's a certain level of respect when you're a competitor that you have to have for your teammates regardless of how things went, no matter what. And, and these people, 
I'm sorry, the word cringe comes to mind. And I don't use that word too often. No matter what, the shots were taken, but this was way after Ye Giant's bleed, which gets me to his next team. With TSG done in NA, I think it's pretty fair to say that out of everybody, Toast suffered the most. But for a moment, let's take our eyes out of NA, because Pacific Ascension had some crazy teams, and one of them was Bleed Esports. Knowing Bleed Esports, these guys are extremely stacked, and this is no surprise because they have venture capital funding, plus their CEO is a hedge fund manager. It's been known for a while that Bleed was ready to make some huge investments in the Valorant scene, but their decision would never come through until they actually got a spot on VCT franchising. And on July 9th of 2023, Bleed Esports would finally beat Scars, granting them a spot with the rest of the tier 1 talent. With stability now assured to Bleed, they were looking to make some big moves. And one of these big moves was catching any Valorant's biggest fish. And before you know it, Bleed Ye was now a thing. With Ye officially joining Bleed for the 2024 season, the Pacific scene would have some new viewers, like the NA fans who were willing to stay up to watch Bleed Ye. This was a huge investment from Bleed, and with Ye moving into the team, people were excited to see him back in Tier 1, but this time in Pacific. Pacific Valorant, for most part, was unpredictable. Apart from Paper X and DRX, most of the teams were very inconsistent. Eventually, the first match for Bleed was set to take place, and Ye was playing Neon on Breeze with an AWP. Not only that, but in the next map, we would see him play as a Sky. These were some questionable roles for him to take on because we never saw him bringing any real value to the team. But this, surprisingly, wouldn't even be the worst role that he would play because in the next game, Ye would play as a Viper against Global Esports. Not once, but twice in that series. And when the dude decides to play Jet on Icebox, they actually win, it's almost like he's more comfortable on Jet or a Chamber. Well, what happens when Ye sticks onto an agent that he can play? He ends up performing well, but for some reason, these comps cooked up by Bleed were just outright bad. Bad. They would then play with zero vipers on both bind and icebox even though they had scary, a player who was deadly on that agent. Things just looked extremely confusing over here for bleed. Nobody had a clue as to what was going on. The IGL at the time, scary, clearly had no control over his team. It was nothing but a downward spiral of doom for Ye and this bleed roster. Ye's run with bleed had hit its own drama, with crazy guy indirectly calling out Ye saying that Ye never played a single match for an entire month. This story of crazy guy would eventually make it into reddit and this would bring Ye's attention. Ye would have to personally explain what the real issue was and he did in his reply but he also did mention this. I will say though that some of the things that happened if it happened in any other profession slash team that person would instantly be kicked slash fired the first time let alone multiple other times. He would never elaborate on this point but we'll get back to this later. Apart from their one victory against DFM they would lose to Zeta Division, Paper X and DRX towards the the end of split 1. This was the end of the road for Ye, as even though stage 2 was up and coming, this was around the time wherein Gangsta would leak the scrim with Ye on DSG. Shortly after this incident, Ye would officially announce that he was gonna take a temporary break from Valorant. And obviously, people knew why. The guy had played for two broken teams, and not only were they the worst in the league, but his own ex-teammate would bite him in the back. Ye's career at the time was at the lowest right now. Everybody was talking about it. We wouldn't hear much from Ye for a while, and people took that as a good sign because maybe he was just staying away from the toxic environment online. Eventually, on the August of 2024, Ye would be spotted multiple times on the North American servers. His name was slowly known and it wasn't long until viewers from other streams caught on to it. He was back in NA and grinding ranked. And the most surprising thing was that he was spotted almost always on the Sentinel row. It looked like he was trying to approach the game in a different way this time. This stream would be followed by many other more. Fans were excited to see him back on the game grinding ranked and as of now it is rumored that he will be trialing for the EG roster and about the bleed situation Ye would have some interesting things to share as he'd end up in a podcast with Baby Bay and Spike Talk I think on DSG we didn't win like a single game like the whole thing and like that's like the worst like I, I've ever done like ever like career wise and like some of the managers would like come in and it's like it's like yeah yeah uh, look at what all these VLO comments are saying about you oh <laughs> and like God, the team. I'm like, bro. Bro, I don't, I don't want to read that. It's like they're all, all these guys are talking so much shit, and it's just like, oh man, I don't, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I don't want that kind of thing. This might have been one of the things he was referencing earlier in his Reddit post when he talked about people being kicked out if what they did happened in another team. Still, it's pretty unclear as to what he really meant. To come from like being like absolute top of the world like number one esports player of the year to like not even getting a single win it's like dude and not to mention 
Um, unfortunately, like even at that time, like I had a lot of real life stuff going on where it's just like real life stuff isn't going well, my work isn't going well, all the and then there's like all this other stuff, and it just became like this like thing where it's just like I don't know, it became like super like overwhelming, I guess, like for a little bit, and then not to mention just have like problems even like with your team and like other stuff like that. You know, it's just be away from home. It, it just all compounds, you know? He shares a lot of things, which includes his personal struggles outside the game and even about things with C9 and how the expectations that were set for every team that he joined. I really recommend that y'all check out this episode in Spike Talk as it's really interesting. On October 4th, Bleed Esports would be removed from the league for not complying with Riot Games after failing to reach critical requirements as part of the VCT partner teams. To maintain the 12-team format for the next year, the Pacific Ascension runner-ups, Boom Esports is now promoted alongside Ascension winners Sinpresa Gaming. With Ye no longer a part of Bleed Esports, he's now an unrestricted free agent. Ye had the best time in Envy and Optic, only to have his chances in Tier 1 ruined by a streak of very bad luck. It has to be said that while some things were in his control, most of them were not, and it really sucks to see him fall off from being the best Valorant player to literally having the worst season back to back. But the good news is that things have slowly started getting better for him, and word is that he'll be playing as a Sentinel for the next team. While many argue that Ye had gotten the bag from Bleed, I'm sure it wasn't worth the team complications and whatnot. This video might be titled as his tragic downfall, but there's a very high chance that he makes a comeback, but I guess we'll have to see. This was a long video, but I hope y'all enjoyed it. I'm Busty Val, and this was the tragic downfall of Valorant's best player. Follow my Twitter at Busty Val, and I'll see you soon. Peace.